Oh 
rescued. We are rescued. Because of our sin, because of our rebellion, we were destined for an eternity apart from our Heavenly Father. But He loved you so much. He loved you so much that He wanted to rescue you from the consequence and from the penalty of sin. And because of one name and one name only, we are rescued for eternity. So can we lift up a shout of praise tonight for the name of Jesus Christ. Clap your hands. Say it out loud. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for rescuing us. Thank you for rescuing us. Father, we come to you in that name of Jesus, the name that is unlike any other, the name that grants us access to your throne room, the name that rescued us from sin. Father, you know all the things that we have done that separate us from you. You know all the hurdles that stand in our life between us and a full relationship with you. We thank you for loving us, even when we do not even know your name. Thank you for loving us so much that you would desire a relationship with us. And thank you, Father, for rescuing us from our own rebellion so that we can be restored this side of eternity and be assured a place with you in glory. Father, you know what each one is facing here tonight. You know what has brought each person into the house of God. Father, we believe you've already been at work in hearts here through our time of worship. And you have more to do as we continue to worship in a few moments and as Pastor John comes to share from God's Word tonight. We lift this entire evening up to you, trusting in the move of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah, that's Amen. 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 Would you reach out and greet someone who's near you and tell them that you're happy to see them tonight at Oak Creek Assembly of God. Well, good evening, and it's great to see you for our 7 p.m. worship service. Hello, if you're watching at oakcreekag.org slash live. If you're with us on Facebook, go ahead and press like and let us know where you're watching. So this morning, before service started, as we were welcoming people in the sanctuary, we were talking about how in Wisconsin we got snow this week. And folks who were joining us from Florida were all too happy to mention that it was not snowing where they are. So... The weather's going to get great here soon. We know it is. Well, we are excited to be here tonight, and a big uh, aspect of our evening service is to celebrate what God did through Oak Creek Assembly of God on Easter weekend. And if you are here for the first time ever, the first time you walked through our doors over Easter weekend, or if you've been around here for decades, you were part of what God did through this church on Easter weekend. And that's what we're here to celebrate tonight. And uh, if you served in any capacity, we're going to get together one more time to connect with you, to thank you, and to hear your feedback. And if we have those locations, can we throw those up on the screen right now? After our service here tonight, we're going to gather in our team huddles uh, at places around the building. Yes, no, maybe so. Ha! Thanks, guys. Sorry, I don't know if you were ready for that, but you are on the spot. Thank you, guys. All right, so if you served on any of our teams last week, this is where we're going to be gathering right after the service today. So make note of the team that you are on and where to head. This is going to be just a real short huddle for us to thank you, for us to uh, hear your feedback about how we can do things even better next time around. And then after, right after those five to ten minute huddles are done, we'll all get together down in the food court this evening uh, for a few sweet treats and refreshments. And uh, we also want you to know that if you did not receive one of our ceramic mugs last week, that we have one for every household. And so we'll bring a box of mugs down there, and we want to make sure that you have one uh, to take home with you as part of being here during Easter weekend. At this time, we'd like to invite our ushers to come forward as we prepare to receive our tithes, offerings, and World Impact Faith Promises. As they're making their way down uh, to the front today, I want to let you know that your pastoral team will be heading out tomorrow uh, morning to be with other ministry leaders from around Wisconsin and northern Michigan to believe together for great things for our region and to make decisions about leadership that uh, oversees 
this church along with many other churches. So as we pray for offering tonight, we'll also be praying for that time. And our lead pastor, Jerry Brooks, is the assistant superintendent over our, over our district. And so he has great leadership responsibilities there as well. And we'll lift him up in prayer at this time as well. Father in heaven, we love you so much. We thank you that your hand is the hand of the great provider, that you know needs before they're even spoken. Father, we ask that you'd be with our pastoral team heading to Oshkosh tomorrow, that you'd be with these ministry leaders, that you would uh, instill a vision for reaching the spiritually lost across Wisconsin and Northern Michigan. Father, that we believe you have placed leaders in this church and in churches throughout our state and in Northern Michigan for a reason and purpose, that you are calling new ministers. And Father, we look forward to hearing the reports we ask that you would give wisdom and discernment to our lead pastor as he has a position of leadership in our region, that you would give him uh, the right wisdom and discernment, Father, as, uh, as he leads these other ministry leaders. We thank you, Father, for what you are going to do in the rest of our time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs>
so good to me. Come on, lift your voice. Sing it out tonight. Oh, we worship you. Oh, our faithful God.
And so uh, let's take a quick video look back at what happened. If you served on the stage or out by the street, you had a part, and we just want to say thank you so much. You know, part of what I want to do, what is remarkable about the message tonight, is not that this is something that I need to prod you into, but it's something that I recognize that you're already doing. And I want to just affirm that and say this is part of our culture as a church. And so tonight's teaching, what Jesus says, is so simple to understand. I want you to ask yourself, what would happen in my life if I did that? We're going to talk about a story of someone in the Bible who went the second mile. And this story is found in Genesis chapter 24. As it starts, Abraham, he is an old man. His wife has died, and it is time for his son Isaac to be married. This was a very important matter. The whole future of the people of Israel relied on this marriage because they were all going to be descendants of Isaac. Abraham had to find a great wife. She had to be someone who could be the mother of his children, raise offspring, and then begin to shape a whole people. How was Abraham going to find a wife for Isaac? There were no dating apps, which he could post a personal ad, attractive nomad with excellent prospects, searching for a female who likes to travel. They couldn't do it that way. The custom in those days is the parent would go find someone for their child to marry. The parent would go out, they would scour the countryside, find a real good candidate, then come home to the kid and say, this is who you're going to marry. The older my two girls get, the more that this biblical mandate seems to make sense. 
So here's what Abraham did. He was not far from death, and so he called his most trusted servant, a man named Eleazar, and Abraham explained, my time is almost done, I'm gonna be gone. The future of Israel and my son needs a wife. She needs to be a person of flawless character. She needs to be someone who will be faithful to God and to Isaac. And so for Abraham, this wasn't just about finding a good spouse for his child. It was also about helping God's promise to create a new people. And so Eliezer, he went out to accomplish this mission. I got to find a wife for Isaac. And he assembled a caravan of 10 camels, all laden with gifts. He knew that he would have to give these gifts to the family of the girl that he would take away. And so he went to a city called Nahor, and the camels kneeled down while he stood outside the town. And Eliezer, he began to pray. This is found in Genesis chapter 24, verse 12. He says, Lord, God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this spring, and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a young woman, please, let down your jar that I may have a drink, and she says, drink, and I will water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. And in those days, hospitality was a very serious thing. It was often the matter between life and death, and it was a good sign of character. Verse 15 says, before he had finished praying, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother, Nahor. The woman was very beautiful, a virgin, no man had ever slept with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. The servant hurried to meet her and said, Please give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. After she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too, until they had enough to drink. Now here's the kicker. We had a camel here last Sunday at church. Some of you rode the camel, even though it was supposed to be for the kids. Do you have any idea how much water a thirsty camel can drink? A thirsty camel at the end of a journey could drink up to 30 gallons of water. Now, do you remember how many camels were in the caravan? 10. So do the math. So he says, can I have a drink of water? And she hands him a drink of water and then says, hey, let me go get another 300 gallons of water all by myself for your camels. I think this girl had some serious biceps. <laughs> and so here's the story. Here's the idea. Rebecca did everything that could have been expected for her and then some. She went the second mile, and it's the second mile that made all the difference in her life. It changed her life, it changed history, because she goes on to marry Isaac and begin a great adventure with God. Rebecca became the ancestor of the people of Israel. Her name is remembered and celebrated to this day. So I want you to imagine the transformation that could happen in your life, perhaps in your work, in your relationships or marriage with your children, and what could happen in our church together if you became the second mile type of person. You can do this. There are lots of things that are not in your control, but this one decidedly is in your control. So could you say this with me? I will go the second mile. I will go the second mile. You can do this whether your work is at an office, whether you're working at home, if you have a cranky boss, if you've been doing the same work functions over and over again and you feel underappreciated, when you go to work tomorrow, you just determine and say, I will go the second mile. 
I will do everything that is reasonably expected of me, and then some. Now, Jesus himself, he talks about this attitude. This is from the most famous sermon ever preached in Matthew 5. And one of the most memorable things Jesus said is found in verse 41. He says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Now, here's the background of this. When Jesus was alive, Israel was occupied by Roman forces. There were Roman soldiers visible everywhere you went, and they were often forced to go on 50-mile marches. They had to carry heavy packs on their backs as they did this. By Roman law, these soldiers were allowed to draft other people to carry their burdens and packs. They could pull anyone off the street and say, hey, you carry this pack for a mile. But when that mile was up, their legal obligation was over, and they could return the backpack. Of course, this was not very popular with people among the day. They didn't like enemy forces occupying their country. And here's what Jesus is saying. You have to do the first mile. You have no choice because it's already law. Understandably, people resent doing it. They do the minimum required, and they are hot and bothered to do it. Jesus says, when you get to the end of that first mile, once in a while, just to really throw them for a loop, say, hey, let me take that burden back. Let's do two. Let me do another mile. Let me carry your burden. I, I see it's a hot day and you must be tired sometimes. Let me serve you another mile. And can you imagine how the conversation begins to change that second mile? All of a sudden, we're starting to ask questions of each other. He says, you know what, man, I have been on, let me tell you about some adventures. I've been on the sea or some snow-packed mountains as we've done some conquests. Everything changes in the second mile. In a world where people are generally only motivated to serve, where they are forced to do it, you can do it voluntarily and with joy. Now, it's important to note, Jesus is not being legalistic. He's not saying, hey, every time someone asks you to do something, you have to say yes and do more than they ask. Jesus wasn't saying you have to tolerate any form of abuse or injustice. You still must use discernment and judgment. There is a time to say no and to set boundaries. Jesus was saying, though, if you want to really do life in the kingdom with the heart that God made you to have, then live as a servant. Find ways to surprise and delight with your servanthood. And don't do it grudgingly, but do it with a sweet spirit. And when you get to the end of mile one, go another. In the previous verse, verse 40, Jesus says, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. Do everything that the law requires, and then some, because it's in the second mile where people really live. It's second mile people who change the world. People take notice when you live this way. Now, Nordstrom is a retailer that is new to the Milwaukee area within the last two years. And what you'll always hear from Nordstrom fans is they love the service. So last year, Joni and I took a trip to Asia, and before leaving, I said, I want to look good when I'm in Asia. I'm going to pick up a shirt at Nordstrom. And so while we were staying at a hotel in Hong Kong, they said, we will dry clean your clothes. And so I gave my shirt to them. The next morning when I tried to put on my shirt, the dry cleaning had shrunk it so much that I couldn't go out in public like that, even though I was in China and I would never see these people again. <laughs> and so when I got home to Milwaukee, I returned back to Nordstrom with my shrunken shirt. They didn't owe me anything, and I knew that. And yet, with no questions asked, they took my shirt back, they ordered me a shirt one size larger, and shipped it to my home for free. 
they went the second mile. Well, it was not long after that, I, I needed a new suit, and it was on a Saturday night, but we were shopping, and I wanted to be able to wear it the next morning for church. Well, guess what? Nordstrom has a tailor at the store, even on Saturday night, and they will tailor your clothes for free while you wait. They went the second mile. Now, when I buy gifts for Joni, I don't normally shop at Nordstrom. So I asked the people where I do normally shop, hey, would you do something like this for me? They said no. They said for one thing, we don't have enough staff working around here. Secondly, you don't spend enough money to make it worthwhile for us. And third, we don't do alterations at Menards. <laughs> So here's the deal. We often settle for just getting by that performance in our jobs and our marriages and our families and even volunteering, you know, around church. What happened to Rebecca was a result of what she did. Suppose you said to a woman, if you will do a job that is fairly hard and it will take a few hours, you will go then on the adventure of a lifetime. You will meet the man of your dreams. He will be handsome, wealthy, he'll have good character. You will travel, you will be significant, you will start an entire nation. You will be ultimately the mother of the Messiah. Your name will be remembered and celebrated throughout history. If you do just this one job well, it will take a few hours. How many of you would be willing to do that if you knew what the result would be? And yet the point that I would like to make is Rebecca has no idea what's about to happen. She simply does this because she is a second mile type of person. You will receive more than you expect when you give more than what is required. When you just try to get by, you will just get by. But when you give and then give some, you will receive and you will receive some more. And it's not necessarily going to be in terms of money, but it will be in terms of life and joy and influence. You will live and then some. Now there's a caveat here. What Jesus is teaching us about being a second mile type of person. This isn't about being a workaholic. This isn't about, hey, this is my pathway to career advancement. This is simply the discovery that the secret of life is about creative, joyful, shoes and servanthood. The question in our minds is how can I delight and surprise? It's going what's beyond required. And so in our time left tonight, I just want to talk about four areas in our lives that we could go the second mile. And I want us to each self-assess, where am I at in all of this? Am I going the second mile, or am I merely doing just what is required? So we'll self-assess. The first area involves your work. Again, you might work in an office, you might work in a school, if you're a student, this is your studies. If you're a homemaker, this is at home with your kids. There's a study that's been published that talks about the secret to longevity in life. And according to this study, the primary indicator of how long you will live is the extent to which you enjoy your work. Now that you know this, how many of you feel like you could drop dead any <laughs> The honesty. So I would like you to rate yourself on a scale of 1 to 10. 10 is I go all, all I go the second mile, 1 is the opposite. So if you're a 10, if you're a second mile type of person, you would say, whatever my hand finds to do, I do it. I do it with all my strength. I really try to focus and concentrate. I have an appropriate level of commitment and passion for my work. I'm not a workaholic, but I'm just stretching myself. That would be a 10. <clears throat> if you're 
If you're a one, on the other hand, you would say, I find myself just doing enough to get by. One of my favorite sayings at work is, that's not my job. <laughs>